Yeah, that's the topic of uh, today is buy now, pay later as a investment class instead of, of a product. But I will try to cover both parts of buy now, pay later as a lending product and as an investment product as well. And towards the end of the presentation, I will introduce Kyle and what we are doing. And I try the presentation to be thought provoking, a bit controversial at times. Uh, please feel free to comment, ask questions, make it uh, interactive. All right. Um, a few words about myself. Uh, so why I'm here talking to you about buy now, pay later. Uh, so I have about 17 years. Yes, it's 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 too much uh, of work experience in uh, retail banking and the consumer finance. Amongst others, uh, I was a director at PwC Consulting in the London office and in the Eastern Europe as well. I was a PMO director at the Home Credit. Was at that time was the largest uh, non-bank lending firm uh, with the presence of several countries, including China and India. And uh, before joining Kyle, my last uh, job was a partner in a boutique consultancy, Black Pine, which is focusing on advising uh, consumer lending firm on credit risk management and the scaling of their operations. I've been for the past five years uh, based out of Singapore, covering the Southeast Asia. I moved uh, here from London and uh, I work mostly in Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, those, those countries around. So it was a lot of traveling before the pandemic, uh, since the pandemic mostly being in Singapore. And, and because uh, uh, it's it's a it's a webcast for the Tokyo fintech. I couldn't resist to offer a, a picture of myself in the in the Aikido outfit. I'm I'm the person on the right. <laughs> just just to be, just just to be sure. Uh, so I enjoyed a bit of a, a bit of a Japanese martial art and a bit of a Japanese uh, culture as well. Uh, so let's let's move to the first part of the talk about buy now pay later, right? As a, as as a product. So let me offer a very simple kind of framework about where the traditional finance mean like a fintech and the capital markets, right? So on the one hand of investing, right? And we have a, a lot of uh, disruption there uh, as well with the wealth tech uh, management, robo advisory and, and stuff like that. On the other hand, we have a banking, which was a synonym uh, for the lending, for uh, collecting the deposits, right, and for going um, uh, for for where where you get your consumer loan, where you get the the, uh, the mortgage. The role of the traditional investing and banking is uh, has been shifting, and in, in the past, like ten years, uh, have been heavily disrupted by the fintech, and that's why I have it in the middle of the circle uh where i would like to talk about the fintech lending uh specifically about buy now pay later and how it is relevant from the investor perspective and how it is disrupting banking from the lending perspective so let me start with the investor perspective and when i'm going to speak about investor perspective we need to speak about alternative investments all right so there's a very interesting phenomenon which uh, strike me ultra high net worth investors have three times of more allocation into, into alternatives than the mass of investors and 10 times more than the retail investors so it's this tells me that like something is happening there why these ultra high net worth investors are so much keen into the alternative investments right and uh, why not the other investors, right? There's, there's probably a lot of a lot of things to play, like in here. One one of the play you could say that uh, perhaps the ultra high net worth are more into the money preservation game, right? Wanted wanted to uh, decrease the exposure to the public markets. That could be one of the reasons. But I think also it's a it's a question of the access to this investment is a question of the insights, question of the foresight, I would say, that the ultra high net worth investors have uh, on these markets. And I would like to dive a little bit deeper into this. So let's look at what has been happening in the public markets, right, since 2020, since the uh, 
beginning of the new times, right? So uh, I'm sorry, someone for is just listening to it, not not looking. I'm showing a, a chart, S and P 500, from 2020 up up to up to now, and then the Vanguard uh, bond market ETF. This is the blue line in here. So we see that the S and P has gained 32 percent, but the overall like a bond market lost um, three percent, right of the of the value. Again, people may be saying that the stock market is, is, is growing that much because the monetary easing is much, much more money in there. That's all true. Uh, but it's also telling us it has been increasingly difficult to create an a income portfolio, income investment, which wouldn't be susceptible to the market volatility. Right, and that's uh, I think why we see that the overall bond market uh, basically being flat over over that uh, that time. Uh, but still, when I when we talk to institutional investors, when we talk to high net worth individuals, they are all like really asking about where we can get income investment, so investment which bring a regular monthly, quarterly income which would be somehow as a safe haven as well, which wouldn't be subject to the wild swing uh, of, the, of the public market. And it's that is like part of the answers why alternatives are kind of hot in that sense, because they typically are, those assets are typically private. They are not uh, floated in any exchanges, right? They are typically meant to be held until the maturity. They are less liquid, which is a pros and cons by its own right as well. It gives you the process that gives you a premium, a liquidity premium, so they are more profitable in the sense. It is a, a cons that you cannot offload them from your portfolio as quickly as a, as a publicly traded instrument. At the same time, sir, we have seen in uh, in this year a, a rapid approach of the inflation right this is the u.s inflation specifically uh, so now is approaching eight percent which again like brings uh, acute questions like to the investors all right uh, if i'm investing to the like a traditional income products which might be yielding me a, a single digit percentage like three four right percent uh, of, of the yield uh, and we see that the inflation actually eight percent it means that I am actually negative right about about five percent there so it's um not an easy uh, thing to be if, if you are an investor who is looking for the income inv investment or if you are even like in someone like a pension fund or somebody who needs to have a income investment in their product who needs this regular cash flow right where where to go actually where to go so it's not um, not an easy situation and and alternatives uh, partially offer the the answer to this conundrum uh, it's another interesting chart which is uh, combining basically all this all these stories like like together this is a, a return 20 years return of the US stocks, uh, bonds, and alternatives like hedge funds, uh, real estates, and the private equity. And uh, we see on the chart that since like 2010, since like two years ago, there's a huge decoupling, right, happening. So basically, there's a runaway of the real estate, private real estate products, and even a greater runaway of the private equity assets. Right, so it seems that there is a lot of demand, and there is a there is a lot of um, there is a lot of um, returns giving to these assets. If I would be a devil's advocate in here and, and try to disrupt this argument, uh, like the private equity assets, right, or the real estate asset, you might say, "Hmm, so there's uh, so much money in the economy, like coming coming in. Perhaps the appreciation of the real estate." appreciation of the private equity is actually because there's there's a lot of more money 
coming into the econ economy and these uh, yields, right, which we are seeing, these returns, this growth, this might be an illusionary thing while it's uh, while this is something which is um which cannot be uh, that that easily like converted uh, back back into the cash and into, into the into the real returns like i think that time will tell uh about this we we see some like indications with uh with the collapse of the uh, spacs right which was which was the exit uh, for the private equity right uh, we might see some things in the real estate why not let's see uh what this chart doesn't tell us right uh, it doesn't show the alternative investments we are dealing with which is a private debt and specifically uh, a consumer finance assets right and it's, it's not showing because this market is still yet kind of more opaque not not enough uh, kind of data not not good indexes uh, in in there which which would be show you the the reverse uh, in there uh, but this this might change as well by uh, players uh, by fintech players like us like or by percent like yield streets or definitive uh, you you might have heard in the us so coming back to our framework right so the so the investing so we we just learned that uh, being an investor like nowadays is exciting and scary at the same time. Uh, looking for uh, income products which wouldn't be correlated with the public market, it's, uh, it's, an, it's a feature a lot of investors are looking at. And they are turning increasingly into the fintech platforms uh, like, like Kyle to deliver these alternatives like uh, income products. And um, a lot of like platforms like us, they, they have a one common denominator that when we are in the lookout for the alternative income investments, we look a lot into consumer finance and the SME lending assets. And the reason for such is that they have a very interesting properties in terms of diversification, in terms of uh, predictability of the cash flow which are coming from these assets. And uh, in terms of often a good geographical uh, diversification and uh, proven resilience in the 2020 around around the COVID time. So, so, so the, these assets becoming a popular and uh, even in, even more popular is a is a phenomena which we've been hearing over the past for two years, which is a buy now pay later, right? And I, I, will, I will get to the buy now pay later. Uh, right in the next slide, but let, let me have a few remarks about banking, right, uh, in, in here. So we would more, mostly like, uh, expect the banks to play the role buy now, pay later, or non-banking lender are doing nowadays, but somehow they stopped playing this role around 2008, right, when they have been burdened by the regulators uh, increasing the capital allocation right for consumer assets uh, and for for the SME lending assets basically more or less like a withdrawing from that market uh, because of uh, regulation because of also their kind of inability to acquire consumers um, in a cost-efficient way, and serve these consumers in a in a in efficient way, and we see like nowadays banks sort of like a playing a role, almost like a public utility, right? With a high capital requirement, very risk averse, very high friction in terms of like dealing in it from the customer perspective. Versus for the past ten years, we have seen the onslaught of the fintechs, which are slowly picking up like one by one services of the banks, starting with uh, payments, then going into lending, then going after the wealth management, uh, and slowly, slowly, basically unbundling the whole notion of the bank on both of the liability side and both on the asset side. 
fintech has a large advantage in here that they are still very lightly regulated and in a number of jurisdictions like for instance in the uk singapore maybe japan as well i'm not that informed about japanese markets they are even encouraged by the regulators go and and pick the balance sheets uh, and uh, pick 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 the services of the banks because the view of the regulators was all right the, the banking sector somehow failed their customers in a way and i'm saying it from a position of ex banker i'm some I'm, I'm shooting uh, into my leg uh, myself as well somehow it, it fails and now the fintech could be at least a partial answer like to to that to disrupt the oligopoly of the banking providers and the fintech are typically much more tech uh, focus and this this tech focus like uh, allows them to, to do things cheaper with a lower friction with uh, easier scalability with um, ability to process a lot of data look at look at the old problems the banking poses in a new kind of way and offering a very fresh solution to the old problems right and by now pay later is, is one, one of these uh, kind of old problems but it's a completely new solution to it uh, so buy now pay later right uh, it, it's a it's a very misunderstood product by a lot of people especially by the people who are um, captured with their thinking with the like old school banking thinking right because uh, usually when you, when you speak with the bankers um, about the buy now pay later you will see oh there's nothing new we had buy now pay later like already for 20 years because we have uh, things like calls like a, a equal payment plan on the on the credit cards right we had the merchant driven uh, installments solutions we have a lot of things right uh, we have a credit cards themselves which which are in a way are also a split payment product but the common denominator and common kind of confusion around here and misunderstanding is that they don't get the the ultimate weapon why the binopulator is so successful and so powerful is that sheer simplicity and superior customer experience of that product from the consumer perspective that's first and second um, how many uh, which which problems is actually solved for the players in the ecosystem for the merchants for the for the customers right so it solves much like a greater set of issues than the simple credit card does right because uh credit cards right uh first of all they it's it's a, it's a very very fascinating product which is very heavily uh, kind of push and subsidize and, and, and promote it by, by the banks. But if we look like uh, realistically at the numbers and the adoption, we will find out that credit cards is a phenomenon of the Anglo-Saxon countries of the US, or UK, New Zealand, Australia, right? Singapore to an extent as well in non-anglo-saxon countries which didn't follow the same part of the development of banking system the credit cards are perhaps at the best like a product which is used to accumulate some loyalty points and they are always uh, kind of paid off the balance is always paid off before actually going to the credit so so the, the product doesn't work as a credit kind of solution it it just like works as, as a deferred payment uh, solution for maybe up to 30 days in that sense so that that's how it's kind of um, does does it's not misunderstood by the consumers it also failed the merchant in a way because when when you are a merchant uh, the banker will come to you and tell you hmm, dear merchant do you want to accept uh, payment by the credit cards right uh, for in exchange for let's say from four to half a percent 
fee, right, of the merchandise value, you will we will process the payment for you, and we will we will do all the all the handling of the settlement and everything. And by the way, we will bring you more customers, right? Because we will these these this people who will come to you with this platinum and gold uh, credit cards, they will actually spend more money with you, right? Because because with uh, uh, because they have a higher spending power, right? And when you are able to service them, then then it will be better for you. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not so easy uh, like this. Uh, so the merchant like and ending paying this kind of tax, right? Uh, and, and the tax is progressively heavier the higher tier credit card is, right? So the platinum card, the merchant pays much more than than for the debit card, right? Processing, even the regulators need to step in and, and set certain like fees because it was uh, it was almost like a tax on the merchants uh, imposed by the banks. But like, is it really like bring them like a more like a sales volume? Is it really like game changer if you are able to, it, it's it's like a common standard expected by the customer. So it, it doesn't work, right? And here come, here come the buy now, pay later providers, which which came with a different proposition, which said, dear merchant, we we are not a credit card for company, we are not a bank. We will uh, allow your customers to split the payment into three or four equal installments. And we will charge you, dear merchant, uh, something between like a six to four percent of the merchandise value. And by the way, uh, here's the statistics. So the merchants around you in your in your area, which which started offering split payments through the buy now ability to our service, they have on average experienced 30% increase in sales. And then merchants say, wow, 30% increase in sales, oh, that, that sounds really good. Right? Why not? And and the merchant will ask, "Oh, dear, buy now, the provider. How much does it cost? And do I need to install a terminal? And will you uh, set some minimum uh, kind of like a balance you'll be holding on my account? And will you pay me after fifty days and stuff?" And, say, and buy now, the provider say, "No, you just uh, put this QR code in here, right? And we will we will settle with you regularly. Maybe in three days, you will you will get the cash, right?" So that's, that's a very attractive proposition, right? Uh, so no integration uh, needed. You just put the QR code there. Very, very simple, understandable product for, for, for the customer. And and if you are, uh, if you are a, like a chain merchant, like a, a fast fashion retailer or electronics producer, the, the buy now, pay later produ- uh, provider like Atomy, they will I- even list your products on their app, right? So you can get discovered actually by the uh, by the customers and they will they will come to you or, or buy online from you so so this is very kind of different proposition than a credit card and i think it it um, really devalidates the argument uh, traditional banks would be saying yeah yeah we had it we had it yes they had it but i didn't explain it properly they didn't didn't outline the value so well for the merchants didn't outline the value for the for the customers, they didn't make it easy for them, right? Versus um, players like Atomi uh, here in Southeast Asia, or Pays like or Afterpay and Klarna, they have a very simple app. That app is cool to use. There's no shame like using it as a, as a post finance product, for instance. Uh, it's a, and it's a no brainer. It doesn't cost you anything as a consumer, right? So that's interesting, and it it and it works very very easy. Uh, it uh, it has three steps, so it's basically a free installment in the, in the three steps, right? It first leads to the discovery, right? So the consumer discovers the products they want, discover the merchants they want in an app, and then they keep paying in, a, in an app, turn any purchase into typically free installments, and then they will pay through a call, closed loop system, completely circumventing the banks completely circumventing Visa MasterCard, right? It's not going through Visa MasterCard network. It's 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 a closed loop system, which the payment costs nothing, right? To the buy now, pay later provider. And, and these savings can be then actually like um, be given back to the customers and be, back to the merchants. 
Right, so I, so I mentioned it's free. It's a no-brainer for a customer to use a binaural operator because it's free, right? It doesn't cost you anything. So you just pay one installment now, another one in a month, and the last one in the next month, right? 0% interest. But is it really free, right? So let's let's look at this calculation in here. Let's, let's assume uh, that the merchant pays 7%, right? This, this was the pricing uh, about two years ago when the buy now penalty was starting. The merchant were paying 7% uh, as a transaction fee, right? Uh, let's assume that it cost uh, $100, right? So $99 for simplicity that the uh, the goods which the customer is buying so the customer buys pays 33 dollars now right and then 33 dollars and 33 dollars right so seven percent out of 99 is about seven dollars which the merchant is is, is paying so seven dollars is the transaction cost this is basically the remuneration for the buy now operator provider for the atomies for the basis for the cardinals right so if you actually calculate the effective interest rate right on this you will shockingly realize it's 144%. Because effectively, this is a 60-day loan, right? With the 7% fee, right? Monthly fee, which is 7% fee. So the APR calculated 7% times 12 is 92%. And if you if you use a, a continuous um, uh, accrual, interest accrual, it's actually 144%. So actually, this is a high yield uh, loan which uh, which looks like zero percent right but it's 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 a high yield loan 144 percent obviously this will be this this number will go down uh, if the mdr is four percent it's going to be somewhere closer uh, to 80 percent um, effective interest rate so much more prof profitable product uh, just by comparison the classical credit card in the uh, in the UK would be about 20, 23% for for like a medium credit score consumer. So it's a much more profitable product in the, in this sense. But let's look at the usage. Let's, let's look at some stats. These stats are mostly from the US, but uh, they kind of mirror the situation. We look in the Southeast Asia as well. So, so this is the McKinsey data. Uh, these are comparison, the, the Black uh, columns are the private label credit cards, and the uh, uh, blue columns is the buy now pay later, right? So the annual spend is about 1,000 US for the buy now pay later customer. The average receivables are also much less; it's about 135 dollars, right? So this is telling us that the average ticket uh, on the buy now pay later transaction is lower than on the traditional credit card kind of transaction, right? But look, looking at the right about the engagement, and this this is uh, something amazing, right? So the credit card customer in the U.S. make on average seven transactions, seven credit transactions, right? With the credit card, it's not not that they pay seven times, seven credit transactions. So they actually go into the installments seven times with this private label credit card. Versus with the binary credit, it's twice as much as fourteen times. Fourteen times, right? This means that they use it like a more more than once in a month, right? They buy something with a buy now pay later product, and also the retention of the consumer twelve months after acquisition is staggering eighty seven percent. So eighty seven percent of the people, after the first transaction, after downloading the app, doing the first transaction, they still keep using it after a year. So this is for me the validation that the product is extremely useful for for the customers. Right. Uh, the another 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 look at average annual revenue per customer. Again, the the, the traditional high yield U.S. private label credit cards is a seventy six dollars. With the buy now pay later is only thirty dollars. Right. But we have also like seen that the the um, number of transactions is much higher and the retention is much higher, which which, which makes all the difference. But let's look at the credit risk. So. Again, these are US data. So net credit losses for the credit card, uh, four to seven percent. By now, pay later, four to six percent. So it's not a higher, higher risk. It's uh, actually a lower risk. And I can tell you, from the data which we see in the Southeast Asia, uh, for the markets like uh, Singapore or the Hong Kong, it's uh, around three to four percent. So it's even even lower 
than 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 what we see here in the US. And the return on assets, this is this is the killer for me. So return on assets of a private label credit card company in the US is three to five percent versus buy now credit company twenty five to thirty percent. Why is that? Because the because of the nature of the product. The nature of the buy now product is basically 60 days loans. So you can turn around your portfolio if you are buy now the provider many, 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 many times over over the year, right? So so it's a very high yield, uh, a very high yield uh, product, which has a high turnover rate, which results in a, in a very high profitability. And that's why we are seeing, that's one of the reasons why we are seeing such a large valuation for the buy now pay later provider. Just recently, our customer Atomi has uh, raised uh, money with the 1.9 billion valuation. Another provider, uh, Credivo or Financel, has a uh, has valuation 2.1 billion US dollars. So they are unicorns, all of them. So it's very profitable, right? But amazingly enough, it doesn't end here. So there's another source of revenue which, which is often forgotten and which is almost completely unavailable for the banks. This is the lead generation fees. So you remember I, I was telling you that Atomies and Klarna's and Afterpays, they, they have an application where they show the products which, uh, which, which their merchants are, are selling, right? And if a customer clicks that product, right, and buys something from the app, right, or, or even goes to store, click, click it on the app and then goes to store and buy in the store. This is counted as a, as a lead which was generated by that app. And this chart is, is showing you, this is, is again US data, but it's not that similar elsewhere. Different kind of merchants what what are the typical margins? I right? see that uh, that certain merchants like a luxury retail or fast fashion has a double digit margin margins. Fast fashion margin is about forty percent. Luxury retail is about sixty percent margin, right? Cost of customer acquisition for the fast fashion company is about sixteen percent. So sixteen percent of the cost of goods they are willing to pay to somebody who they will bring to their website where they will buy the product, right? Or bring to their shop. So this is additional source of the revenue for the buy now operator providers, which are bringing these leads to those merchants. And it's not surprising that specifically I'm speaking now for the Southeast Asia, that the biggest category of the goods which are purchased uh, by uh, by the means of payment buy now operator is the fast fashion. So Zalora, Zara, Shane, those are, those are uh, fast fashion providers here in the Southeast Asia. They are the biggest customers of the buy now pay later. And they are the biggest uh, uh, beneficiaries uh, of these. And that's also why, I don't have a slide for that, but this, there's a, also a, a generational shift in the consumers who are using buy now pay later pro, uh, solutions and which are using a credit cards or other means of credit. So the buy now pay later folks are younger, more tech savvy. They spend more time with their mobile phone. They buy more uh, with the less tickets, but they buy more, right? And they really appreciate this, uh, simplicity, low friction way of uh, interacting with these uh, apps. So I think that's, that's why it's a, that's why the buy now operator is growing so fast. There's another reason for the huge valuation. And because it's a betting on the young population. And for instance, here in Southeast Asia, we have a, a lot of repositories of a young population in the countries like Indonesia, right? Philippines or Malaysia. Where, where there is still a lot and lots of potential for the buy now pay later. It, uh, so far the portfolios, right, which we see here in the region, that was just a small, small, small bite. This was like an ant, like, like eating uh, a huge cake, right? And, and this, uh, this is gonna grow very considerably. 
yeah so let me let me move on on in in what we are doing and and who we are and why i'm talking here to you about the binary later uh so we are we are an alternative investment platform focusing mostly giving investors exposure income investment by investing into the consumer debt and SME debt. We have an office in Singapore. We are regulated uh, broker deal in securities in Singapore. Our second office is in Abu Dhabi, where we have a tech startup license. Uh, our shareholders are Visa, Dubai Fintech Ventures, uh, Mashrek Bank, and the, and the Purple Ventures. And what we do, most of the uh, days I'm busy processing and analyzing large amounts of data, on uh, looking at the loan books uh, of the binopulator providers, other consumer lending providers, and turning these assets into the investable assets for investors with the, with the yield uh, starting at 7% and, and ending at the 11% per, per annum. So this is what we are doing. We, we operate the business as a, as a two-sided platform. So you can imagine it a bit as an Amazon, but for the investments, so we are deal providers like a binary companies. Uh, they issue uh, private bonds, right? These bonds are the inventory uh, for for us in this Amazon-like comparison, and investors buy these bonds uh, in exchange for for the investments. And these bonds uh, then bring monthly or quarterly returns. We also uh, quite, are quite flexible, which is another nice feature of the of this kind of assets because they are uh, very quickly turning around. That's why we can offer our investors, despite being a private, um, uh, privately placed product, there's a lot of liquidity. Uh, every three months, uh, they can fully redeem the investments just simply because uh, every two months, our, our, our customers, the deal providers, uh, encash their portfolio, right? And replace with the new new loans, All right? So how, how we do this? we we discover the alternative investment through the data science. So we, we practically know all the major non-banking uh, loan originators, consumer finance, semi-lending companies in the Southeast Asia. We produce the investable assets from whatever they are doing. We distribute these assets to investors. And then we monitor and service investors until the investment is fully redeemed. So it's not that we sell something to an investor and then, then go away, right? We are there all the time through the whole life cycle and we do it over and over again. We work uh, both with institutional investors and the indi individual investors and the indiv individual investors invest on the same terms of institutions. So they are not uh, having a short straw, as we say. <laughs> Is the, is the same kind of kind of uh, condition, same kind of uh, deals. Uh, in Southeast Asia, we work with uh, the, the largest binopulator provider, Atomi. We work with the Home Credit, who is the largest consumer finance firm in Indonesia and Philippines. Robocash is a digital bank in Philippines. Revo is an invoice discounting firm, helping Indian exporters to finance their invoices to the US and European retail chains. Cream Finance, again, is, is a consumer lending provider. All right, uh, Norbert, uh, if, if you want, I can stop here and open it for a question because we have a last 15 minutes. Uh, otherwise, I can continue talking. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very, very deep. Thank you for that. Um, maybe you can talk a bit more about this structure. So given that these are relatively small loans that turn over quickly, as you said, uh -huh. What is what is your mechanism to make them investable, right? So the, sure. the classic way of taking um, loans is to securitize them, but I don't think that's what you're doing, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's not what we are doing because we are not doing it because it's not very common in in Asia, in the Southeast Asia specifically, in, in the US, uh, much much more common. What we are doing uh, that we we accumulate uh, investor funds uh, through an investment vehicle, uh, which is which is proper, properly uh, hold uh, by a trustee. So it's a, it's, it's a bankruptcy remount. Uh, sorry for the investment lingo. Uh, investment vehicle, and that uh, investment vehicle will issue a loan facility to one of our loan originators, right? Like Atomi, so like a home credit, and then from that investment vehicle, we issue a private bonds which are linked to the performance of that of that of that loan facility 
And as a, as a regulated securities uh, broker dealer, in a regulated way, we offer those to investors through our investment platform in Singapore. In order to increase the security of, of that loan facility, we ask um, our customers to provide uh, corporate guarantee, shareholder guarantee, or a pledge of the receivables, or sometimes even the whole portfolio whole loan book to that investment vehicle. And here comes actually with our data science capabilities because we are able to understand the loan book to the granularity of the, each individual loans they are issuing. And we are able to foresee with the 95% accuracy, 95% is the accuracy for the next six months, how much cash will that loan book be generating? So basically we have a, we have a cash generating assets which with the 95% accuracy generating certain cash stream and we have that asset pledged to us right as a security for for that loan and so i've allowed the microphone on for everybody else as well so if you have a question i think you can just switch your microphone on or you can use the chat to ask the question um while you think about yours i've got another one um, that's like ultimately for, for any lending and, and any of these constructs, the proof is in the pudding really when we hit a crisis, right? Mm -hmm. and, and obviously you have very short term assets, so it's not like I have a, a, a 30 year mortgage or a variable mortgage that, that can totally change the terms after like five years of free interest. So it, it seems much safer from that perspective but what what have you done in terms of stress testing so are there is enough uh global uncertainty that, that <laughs> we necessarily need to talk about on on this call but what happens if the economy suddenly takes a dive right yeah. the consumers lose their jobs um how resilient is this model and how resilient is the individual investment yeah, great question. We even have a data for, for, for this yeah, because you, you are right. We are, we are operating for uh, the company is two years old, but we are we are live and operating for a year. Right. So so we, we did launch after COVID crisis. Now now we are bracing this uh, political upheaval uh, with, with Russia and Ukraine. But nevertheless, we, we have a long history of these loan books. So we have a, up to five years of history of the loan book. So we, 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 we simulate through that the crisis and we, we have witnessed the COVID crisis, which was a big test, right? Because suddenly there was a lockdown in many of the countries. People couldn't go to work. People didn't, they, they lost income. So what we've seen there, there was a drawdown between 20 to 30% in the cash flows from those loan books. But specifically, this drawdown lasted three months from March, April, up to May to, to some extent, 2020. That would be happened. But then what happened afterwards? Uh, the loan originators, the consumer finance companies have tightened the criteria for the issuing of the new loans. And the quality actually of, of, that, of that loan book has improved afterwards, right? And it, it, was, it was twofold because the criteria has been tightened, but also, and that's a bit unfortunate a re reason, like a more people from more affluent layers of the society started actually using those like credits solutions right so so that that was that was one of the reasons what um, what what kind of happened so it was one test uh, obviously like a, a, another like a test which we are in the lookout to have a look at the foreign exchange right uh, we we want to make sure that um, we, we, we stress test against potential devaluation of the of the of the currencies, right? Because we those assets are in places like Philippines, like Indonesia, right? Others, so so we employ, we encourage the uh, customers to use hedging mechanisms, and then and very often they do, right? If they don't do, we, we try to price it in, in into the price of the loan. Then you, you mentioned valuations, and, and clearly, like these. These fintech waves, they, they come right and, and go, 
And so the more mature markets, even for buy now, pay later, clearly the the US and, and Australia for that matter. Uh, but also in that regard, uh, we've seen a firm, and if I take like a, a November-ish peak, uh, I think it was over 100. They had just reported fourth quarter earnings. They went down to basically a third of that. They have recovered a bit. Uh, but Afterpay, I think, also has taken quite a beating after they got acquired. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So is, is this market getting stressed because it's getting mm -hmm. overcrowded? Right? Have we hit the limit in terms of what can be done in a certain geography? And you're lucky for you, you're riding, let's say, the, the late part of the wave that just kind of builds up in Southeast Asia now. But So is this sustainable or is this now a, a hmm. three to four year type of thing uh i it, it's um thanks for the question there we, we need to a bit unbundle this 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 question so, so you correctly say fortunately we are not uh exposed to the major markets we are not in the us uk we are in southeast asia this is a different situation right so so that is underserved of the by the bank story is also like a fuels the demand right versus in the major market you have a lot of competition right in there i, I think the buy now pay later as i say uh, maybe five four years when the cloud now like first started the buy now pay later product wasn't well understood uh, and wasn't the the true benefit haven't been clearly kind of revealed right and a lot of players have kind of pitched it in as a as a payment uh, as a as a kind of uh, installment solution at the payment at the time of the payment and they went deliberately designed the product to be competing with the merchant acquiring solution with the payment gateway right and you you have seen it and we have seen a few quite a few acquisition by the payment gateway providers uh, e-commerce late, late lately providers like picking up on these a little bit like a weaker or less established buy now pay later kind of players and um, if you play this, this way right as if you if you position yourself i'm a payment provider then you are inherently kind of saying i am in a cost efficiency game right if you play it as atomi is playing or as a as a credivo right or, or the others which are the, the, the later wave which i hope that is going to be like more successful then you are saying i'm somebody who is helping you to increase sales the merchant so yes i'm bringing savings as well but it's ultimately about the sales and it was this my slide about the lead generation like fees which are way way higher than actually the payment fees because what, what we see and uh, uh, there's a third part of a story eh? By now, it started with a 7% fee. Now we see the fees be on average about 4%, right? Even here in the Southeast Asia. And for the large merchants, I'm sure it's even lower, right? So so I think it's a, it's a, it's a starting to be a price competition uh, in the major markets. It's, it's starting to be competition with the substitute, sub substitute products in the, in the major, major markets as well. And the third uh, is the business model kind of question, like in there. So the more successful business model haven't been introduced yet. Thank you. And in terms of your, your platform, I think on, on your website, also BNPL and, and the consumer finance side was really one of the segments that mm -hmm. you intend to focus on. And mm -hmm. the second one, which is also gaining traction quite quite a bit is financing of SaaS startups that have gained traction and, and have mm -hmm. a reliable, predictable mm -hmm. uh, trajectory for the monthly payments that, that yep. they get. And you can basically finance that and substitute a debt financing for selling additional equity. So the, the models that you have should be able to apply right, with some modification to that type of financing too. Is that something that you foresee happening this year or because the BNPL opportunity is so big currently that that will be the near-term focus and everything else kind of comes later? Yeah, we are looking into any assets which have a, have a characteristic. They, they offer competitive yields, one. 
Second, they are not correlated to the mainstream financial market. And the third, they have a good liquidity and good predictability, right? In this sense. So, so those, those which you have mentioned, definitely they fulfill those. But if I look at the depth of the market, right? If I, if I look at the depth of the consumer lending market, just here in Southeast Asia where we play, in the summer last year, we have calculated that the outstanding portfolios issued by the non-banking lenders in the consumer and SME assets was 350 billion US dollars for the Southeast Asia, right? I I didn't, I don't know how to do a proper market sizing for, for that other opportunity, but I don't think it's going to be that, that, that large. And that's why we go for the larger market first. Makes sense. Thank you. And um, so maybe then to, to round it out, uh, obviously you said you're, uh, you're in in the market with institutional, but also um, I wouldn't call them necessarily retail investor because you need a, need to be an accredited uh, investor still. But individuals can invest on your platform, and so yes. Um, yes. with all the required caveats of do your own research and uh, right cons and consult with your financial advisor if you if you need to blah blah we're not selling investments products here as part of Tokyo fintech but if you were to be interested in learning more about the platform it's probably as simple as checking out your your website and go through uh, the initial onboarding steps yes yes correct and what is what's the minimum investment that people need to make and the duration, how much, how, how long is the money locked up? Is this truly only like the two or three month cycle or other longer commitments? A great question. So, so there's no minimum, there, there's no minimum, but it, we, we didn't set the minimum because we didn't feel a need for it uh, yet. Uh, and uh, secondly, the, the private bonds which are issuing are, are typical over the several years and they have a characteristic of a balloon payment. So it's a, it's something that so you put there and it gives you a regular income. You can take the income or reinvest it. Uh, again, it's up to you. But there is a three months, every three months, uh, there is a redemption window. So practically, it's 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 a three months um, maturity, right, in a way. Cool. I think I'm kind of out of question and I looked at this before, so maybe <laughs> some of mine are, have already been answered. Um, we've got a pretty quiet crowd today. If there's no other questions, I think, uh, thank you, Radek. That was a very deep discussion. I think we all understand the the mechanics of being peer much better and then how you fit into that, that picture and actually and enable that and enable both the um the, the the consumer companies as well as the investors to partake in this market uh, i think that's it's the essence of what fintech is for me right to to bridge these opportunities and make them accessible in a smart way uh, with big data analysis and ai so that we get all the buzzwords in here but obviously there's a lot of heavy lifting on the on the yep. data and making sure that right you're comfortable what you what you're taking on because ultimately your reputation is is on the line and it is as you it said is. at the outset a regulated business so the mas will be breathing down your neck if something goes wrong and that's it's a, i think it's a good certificate to have and then an approval to be under a, a well-recognized and still innovative jurisdiction. That's how I would describe the MAS. So thank you very much for the presentation. I think that was very, very insightful. And uh, if anybody wants to go back to this, we'll, we'll make it available over the next day or two also on, on the YouTube channel. And we'll, we'll probably do some outtakes on uh, some of the, the key points that Radek made in, in a shorter, shorter form content. So. Thanks very much for joining. Um, thanks very much, Radek, for the presentation and the, the, the Carl team. Uh, we'll be back next week, I think. We'll do another one, which will be actually lunchtime Tokyo on Wednesday. So if you're interested uh, in that, I will be a bit back to blockchain Web3 type of discussion. So 
that's it for now. Uh, but like you still have a work day ahead of you. We'll enjoy our uh, end of day beer here in Asia. So thanks a lot. Enjoy. Have Thank you good. very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.